Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Michael Robinson Dorn. I teach over the law school, and it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, today's speaker in the Bevan series to you, Professor Josh Eagle. Professor Eagle is a professor at University of South Carolina School of Law, where he teaches property, environmental law, and natural resources law. He's also affiliated with that university's uh, marine program and its uh, program on the environment. Before he joined the faculty there in 2004, he uh, was teaching at the Stanford University Law School, uh, directing their fisheries project, which was an interdisciplinary project trying to bring uh, more science to bear uh, together with the law on the development of fisheries management. Uh, prior to that, immediately after graduating from law school, he practiced uh, for five years with the U.S. Department of Justice in their honors program. He's a graduate of the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he has a master's in forestry from Colorado State and his law degree from Georgetown. Uh, he's widely published in a number of environmental fields, and in particular relevance to today, endangered species and marine policy. He's the co-author of a forthcoming book uh, entitled, God, I love, sorry, The Law of the Coast, uh, Conservation and Development of Coastal Lands. And today he'll be talking about, as you can see right behind me, the history, fascinating story, the history of the marine conservation movement. So if you would join me in welcoming our speaker today, please. state. 
uh, going from New England all the way around down to the South Atlantic and the Gulf, uh, the Western Pacific and the North Pacific. And each uh, council has a certain number of uh, two different types of members, uh, what are called uh, mandatory members, which are generally uh, state fishery management officials. Uh, and then the other half are appointed members, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, those are members who are appointed by the governor of the states that border that particular council jurisdiction. Okay, so the councils produce these decisions. Um, and the decisions are subject to some procedural and, sub, um, and substantive constraints that are in the Magnuson-Stevens Act. So there's some limit on what the councils can and can't do, and those have changed over time, starting out in 1977, um, and then the Act has been significantly amended at least twice, um, maybe more than that, but at least two big ones in the last uh, 15 years. Okay, and uh, also I should point out, there is some oversight of what councils do, uh, not just the constraints that are in the statute, but the National Marine Fisheries Service has uh, the responsibility for ensuring that council decisions are consistent with the fishery management plans, the long-term plans produced by councils, as well as with the 10 national standards that are in the Act, uh, in the Magnuson Act. And also, uh, we can get to a point of, point of, we'll talk about this in a second, uh, where courts will have some jurisdiction over council decisions. Right, that's the Federal Fishery Management Enterprise. Um, it's produced a 35-year series of resource management decisions, right? Quotas, uh, year types. Uh, we could go through, I don't know how many thousands of decisions. Uh, and those decisions impact day-to-day -day lives of uh, uh, fishermen, the industry, the finance of the industry, community economics, not to mention stocks of fish, as well as uh, non-target bycatch, marine mammals, habitat, uh, other parts of the ocean system. Okay. Um, and one thing that's interesting is that most of our assessments, um, really, of this system are trying to focus on measurables. Uh, you know, what, what's the current status of stocks? Are they overfished, not overfished, subject to overfishing? Uh, you know, how much are we losing in terms of lost yield, both in terms of amount of fish uh, and uh, money? Focusing on sort of very objective criteria. So that's not what I'm going to do today at all. I'm not, uh, I've done that in the past, but I'm not doing that today. Okay, so the marine conservation movement, something that was created um, or not on purpose, but it kind of came about uh, in 1990, as far as I can tell, um, based on my research in, uh, in the area. Um, and what I mean by it came about in 1990 is that's when groups really first started trying to influence the council decision-making process, this federal fishery management enterprise. Uh, prior to that time, obviously, the international marine conservation community had worked on whaling since the 60s, late 60s, and early 70s. Um, there, there's almost no actual uh, involvement of environmental groups uh, during the uh, debate and passage of the Magnuson Act in the uh, mid-70s, 1976, 77. Uh, weren't really involved in that. Uh, but were involved in, say, tuna dolphin in the 80s. But in terms of focusing on fisheries, uh, that's, that started in uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, as far as I can tell, again, um, it began with a single person, uh, a guy named Pete Shelley, uh, the lead singer of the Buzzcocks, for those of you who are uh, but Pete Shelley, the attorney for the Conservation Law Foundation, um, who essentially just started uh, following along at what was going on with the New England Regional Fishery Management uh, Council, which during this period had been doing things one might consider to be somewhat egregious. Uh, for example, uh, there's a famous period from 1977 to 1982 uh, that I would call sort of the adjustable quota or demand-based quota uh, era, uh, when the New England Council at its quarterly meetings would reset the annual quota uh, higher at each meeting until finally, uh, by the end of the year, surprisingly, the fishermen had not yet exceeded it. And so uh, Peter began following this, and although the statute at that time was relatively vague, in other words, it said uh, at that time National Standard <coughs> 1 existed, and said uh, the council was supposed to prevent overfishing, the, the law didn't say what the council was supposed to do if there was overfishing. It didn't have any rebuilding uh, requirements specifically written in. So he, uh, or the group brought a lawsuit and eventually was settled uh, that required the council to develop a plan to rebuild the fishery. That was around 92. Um, and really that's the first uh, kind of involvement 
uh, with fishery management. And so over the last 20 years, um, I say here, uh, the movement has grown to include about 10 marine conservation groups and programs and three major funders. It might be more than that. We talk about local and regional groups, but in terms of the national groups, it's probably fewer than 10. Um, and I say groups or programs, in other words, sometimes as with Audubon, Audubon when I worked there had something called the Living Oceans Program, which was a small component, a three person component of Audubon. Um, and sometimes we have full groups, and so Oceana, which is a full uh, standalone group uh, that evolved out of something else. Um, but it's a very small number of people and groups. I mean, it's interesting to think of it as a social movement when really it's not, um, it's never a bottom up, you know, thousands of uh, members of the public care about federal fisheries management. Um, rather, what it was for about 40 or 50 people over time that become very interested in uh, this issue. And also over time, we've seen input, although this was more in the late 90s, uh, money from three large, uh, relatively large foundations, the Moore Foundation most recently, uh, and before that, Pew and uh, Pew Charitable Trust and the uh, uh, Packer Foundation. But we're not talking about a lot of money uh, overall uh, being invested in this. But they're players in the sense that they uh, care about and coordinate what these groups are doing. Okay, um, and over time, over this 20 year period, this is what's interesting, hopefully, about what I'm gonna tell you today, is I'll give you my theory in a second, but these groups have used a variety of tools, and some groups are more closely associated with use of certain kinds of uh, tools to try to influence uh, this federal fishery management enterprise, the decisions and the results. It's hard to figure out, it really is, when I went back and tried to uh, figure it out, uh, what it is exactly that, because I started out trying to do this myself in 1996 for National Audubon, what, what is it that we were trying to get? Um, other than simply better fishery management, was there some uh, kind of more specific way I could think about that? I, I'm still working on that. I, I have some ideas. Um, but the idea was to influence the decisions and somehow get better results. How do we define that? Okay, so now finally I get to, I have some hypotheses. And basically, um, hopefully I didn't write this in a way that's incomprehensible to myself, but uh, essentially, what I see is I see the marine conservation movement as something of kind of an organism. In other words, this sort of, and it is a relatively small group of people that over time has tried certain strategies in order to influence the system and repeatedly, I think, failed. Um, and then in response to that, try uh, new things. And when we look to see what it is that they're trying, the new things, we can see what it is they've learned about the system and then we can learn about the system as well that's interesting, I guess, from a historical perspective, but it's also interesting to think about how actually, if they did want to uh, make some changes, they could do it, or perhaps try to do it in the future. So, hypothesis one is we can learn from the failures of um, the marine conservation movement. And I don't mean failures like they're terrible people, they shouldn't be doing it, they have no influence, but I don't think they really succeeded in what they uh, uh, were trying to do. Uh, secondly, this is a big one, um, <coughs> To this day, uh, members of the marine conservation movement insist that uh, there is such a thing as objectively good fisheries management, that we can all have a win-win situation, fishermen want sustainable fisheries, I, you know, we all want sustainable fisheries, and that's what we're trying to get to. I think that's actually uh, problematic, and mainly because there's the, the terminology uh, that's used uh, may be similar, uh, sustainable fisheries or conservation, but those words mean very different things. Uh, to fishermen and to members of the marine conservation uh, movement. And I think until um, conservation groups recognize this and actually come out and admit that what they want is something different uh, from what the uh, industry wants, that they won't actually make uh, any real progress. <coughs> okay, so uh, real quickly, this is my hypothesis one. Movement discovers obstacles and adjusts accordingly. Um, all social movements, right? Civil. Uh, civil rights movement, um, larger scale environmental movement. I just saw something on the USA Today. I stepped over, uh, coming out of the hotel room, about uh, <laughs> the global warming movement, right? I guess that's the movement to convince the world to do something about uh, global warming. All these kinds of social movements uh, face political and other kinds of obstacles. And 
So just to give you a sense, remember I told you the, the, the hypothesis that we're going to look at responses to uh, obstacles to success. But it's kind of give you a shortcut. There were kind of three primary obstacles to getting any influence over this process, okay? to having the voice of the marine conservation movement heard in federal fisheries management. Uh, number one, the statute itself was really uh, not set up as a conservation law. It started out as an industry regulation law. As I said, there were no conservationists really involved uh, in writing it. It wasn't really a concern. No one really thought that there was a conservation interest in fish other than uh, from an economic perspective at the beginning. Uh, and the law is built essentially uh, with deference to the status quo. So in other words, if someone wanted to change the way things were being done in fisheries management, the burden of proof was on them. Okay? And when we've got a lot of scientific uh, uncertainty about what's going on with fish stocks, that's a pretty tough uh, burden to meet. Okay? So that's one of the big obstacles. Uh, the second one is the ever popular uh, concentrated, diffuse dynamic. And this is something that's been written about in every context, not just environmental or fishery, um, started out, gosh, I think the first book on this was written in the 30s, or something like that. And it's a pretty simple theory, I'll explain it in a second. It has to do with which, uh, which members of society have an economic incentive to participate in government decision-making <coughs> processes. And it's usually, just to tell you the answer, uh, it's people who have the greatest financial stake in the decision race. Uh, fairly straightforward. Um, and of course, there was a special obstacle, which I'll talk about uh, in the case of fisheries, which is that Congress, uh, for reasons we can talk about if you want, decided to take this concentrated diffuse dynamic, that is, uh, the power of uh, the, those people with the greatest financial interest, and do something that hasn't been done in any other area of American uh, law, regulation, uh, any field, and that is put those uh, people in charge of making decisions about how the resource was going to be used. And that turns out to be the single biggest obstacle, and the one that I don't believe that the conservation groups have yet overcome in terms of influencing uh, decision making. Okay, so concentrating diffuse in a nutshell, then when you go to law school, we have some people who have sort of a law school joke. Um, they have little nutshell books that they, it's like cliff notes. Uh, <laughs> so, it costs money to participate in government decision-making processes. Yes, that's not it. Uh, time, money. A person uh, or group will always participate, right, where the potential financial impact of the decision on her is greater than the cost of participating, right? There's a potential uh, benefit. I guess you have to factor in some probability there as well. But that's the idea. And conversely, right, if I, if, it, if it's going to have a 10 cent impact on me if uh, COD collapsed, I'm not going to spend more than 10 cents to travel to New England and go try to have my voice heard at the council, right? It's just not worth it to me. So we have this concentrated groups, that is the people showing up with the vested financial interest, i.e. the fishing industry, and uh, the general public, while it has a cost to them, that cost doesn't make it worth showing up. So we have an appearance uh, from the agency decision makers' perspective that the only people who care about this are the people uh, who are showing up and who will, uh, who have it on the stake. So here's my illustration of the concentrated diffuse uh, problem, right? You can put it in any context you want here. It's uh, you know, uh, public comment on, let's say, whether a particular drug should be approved. So on the one hand, right, we've got an industry that might make billions of dollars uh, from selling the product. Those costs are, uh, those benefits are very apparent. So of course, it's worth spending millions of dollars to try to influence that approval process. On the other hand, all of us who might eventually die from taking the product and it turns out to be effective. First of all, we don't know that. That's one of the problems. But secondly, you know, it's, it might happen eventually. The costs are just not clear. And so we don't we have very little incentive to actually go and participate. So from an FDA perspective, right, they're going to hear a lot more uh, from this concentrated side. And at least theory predicts that they're going to uh, follow along uh, with that sometime. Because after all, if you think about it, and you're an agency, and, and what are you going to tell uh, the people who show up and actually care? Uh, I know you're the only ones who care, but I'm going to do something uh, different than that. Right? It's not, uh, it sounds almost undemocratic. So okay, so um, we look at the fisheries world. We just change that over there to care about sustainable fisheries. That's even worse than even less uh, costly than might eventually die. 
um, <laughs> care about sustainable fisheries, and then we have might make billions of dollars uh, from the product that would be uh, in the fishing industry. But then what we do is replace the Food and Drug uh, Administration with the Fishery Management Council. That also might make billions of dollars, uh, remember, uh, from selling the product. And you can see that we create a special, um, I'm trying to think of the right word for this, but a special um, uh, fortress, almost, uh, <coughs> that was constructed by Senators Maggs and Stevens uh, that was really impenetrable. Uh, by the marine conservation uh, movement, and it remains, in my opinion, uh, to this day that way. So, um, just one other point about concentrated diffuse, of course, the longer and more science intensive the process, the greater the advantage of the concentrated group, right? The more we have to spend money, the more we have to show up. The benefits go to the people who have more money and more time and more incentive to participate. The more scientific uncertainty, the better. We see this also. Uh, climate change and so on, right? That stuff is great for spending money, creating uh, benefit, uh, creating doubt, and so on. And of course, if we have a pre-existing right to conduct the activity, in other words, if the other side has the burden of proof as in fisheries, then even better. Okay, so um, what I want to do now real quickly is talk about these different uh, tactics that the marine conservation movement used over this 20-year period. And see if we can figure out the little, uh, they were, let me, let me say it this way. Each one of these will reveal them learning uh, those things I just told you, I think. Okay. First tool, this is one I did and spent a lot of uh, money on aspirin as a result, uh, attending council meetings and lobbying for different decisions. In other words, councils considering a particular quota, uh, lobbying well, looking at the science and saying, actually, I think that's a little too high, here's why I think that. Uh, not particularly effective, not particularly effective. In other words, uh, council does not uh, respond in general to that uh, until later. We'll see maybe why. The obstacles to this are interesting. Um, first of all, like I said, there's a status quo bias and burden of proof. In other words, you haven't presented, uh, let's call me evil, evil, you haven't presented, me, uh, uh, presented us with any uh, new information or enough information to kind of get us to change what we were doing. You haven't met this super burden of proof, uh, so therefore we're not going to change. Uh, number two, uh, the absence of sympathetic ears on the council. About 85% of appointed council members, that is council members appointed by governors pursuant to the statute, come from the fishing industry. Uh, at any given time now there might be uh, have 120 council members, maybe two from environmental groups, and I think that's most there's, there's ever been. Uh, so generally speaking, not really uh, anyone there who uh, shares your uh, viewpoints on the world. Uh, low public salience. This is interesting. We talk about public resource management. We have this obstacle that only the people who really are dependent on the resource to earn a living are the ones who ought to have a strong voice in how it's used. It's a sort of a, a, a bias against non-use or I guess use as wildlife or some, some other use uh, that doesn't produce income. Um, it's seen as sort of uh, not that important again, uh, to the councils um, to consider anything like that. At least it used to be that way, much more so. Uh, scientific uncertainty, again, we can say, well, we're not sure. That's all very interesting, uh, Eagle, but um, there's plenty of other information out there that says you're wrong, and so therefore we're not going to pay attention to you. Um, but mainly one of the things that turns up, and I've talked to lots of people about this, is Almost this feeling, this is, goes back to our fortress feeling, that the system was set up uh, really as a, almost a, a, a club of people who were truly interested in the resource, and that someone who didn't actually make a living from the resource or represented an environmental group um, was an illegitimate participant in this system, had no reason whatsoever to be there. In fact, was, as one of my fellow lobbyists used to call us, uh, was, we were seen as sort of meddlers uh, in this. And you might think that's a little strong, but I'll just give you an example. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, findings of all time. This was uh, in May 1998, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, the Coast Guard conducted three workshops to gather information from the industry and the management community. So this includes all council members uh, regarding their perception, perception of the present state of fisheries enforcement. Okay? Um, gather, or sorry, garner recommendations on how to improve the performance of fisheries enforcement, et cetera. Workshop participants included in commercial industry, rec industry, 
council members, NIMS, and state management agencies. Okay, so what do we find in our uh, workshops? Question one, what is the greatest, what are the greatest threats to maintaining sustainable fisheries in your region? Okay. First, number one, uh, greatest overall threat. All right, we should do this sort of like uh, family feud. <laughs> Exactly how that goes. Anyway. Okay. Bycatch. We can all agree on that, maybe. I don't know. Uh, Northeast Alaska Pacific Coast subgroups all offer specific comments, blah, 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 bycatch, etc. All right, I can see that as a threat to sustainable fisheries. Three, four, and five. Uh, lack of international cooperation. Right, we've got problems with straddling stocks and so forth. Overcapacity. That's definitely a problem. You know that. Air conflict and so on. But the number two. Right, greatest threat to maintaining sustainable fishery in your region, environmental management <laughs> organizations, uh, Alaska and Northeast subgroups express concern over the growing influence of environmental NGOs in the fisheries management process. Okay, and I, this didn't surprise me because this is how I felt when I went, right? Uh, specific uh, concerns included NGO action based on inaccurate scientific information, right? So basically the scientific uncertainty in the event. And inaccurate environmental assessments, misleading public opinion of the fishing industry. So it wasn't a welcoming environment. <laughs> um, okay, so what happens after this first phase when there's sort of direct attempts, you know, going to council meetings, and trying to convince uh, council members to do something different? Now we're sort of into the 94, 1994 time frame. Um, uh, so basically, uh, the conservation group started to go outside the council system, right? Find more receptive here. So we had two options. Number one was litigation, go to the courts, right? Start suing the government. Basically, you have to sue the answer for council decisions. That's the way it works. Uh, but suing the government over bad council decisions. Uh, and also going to Congress and trying to get Congress to change the laws, the rules that essentially would further constrain the council. So constraining them from the outside rather than convincing them to do something differently. Um, problems with this are, number one, because of administrative law and because of what we call uh, you know, uh, court deference to agency decision making, um, courts offer help only on the margins. In other words, courts are good when, for example, one of those famous uh, cases um, we worked on back in, I don't know, 1999, Summer Flounder case. There, um, we won because the council, uh, in that case the Mid-Atlantic Council, uh, chose out of a whole range of possible uh, quotas for that year for summer flounder, uh, the one that had a 3% chance of meeting the rebuilding target. Okay, And NIFS, in its, uh, sorry, for those of you out there in the employees in the audience, uh, NIFS in its, uh, showed its backbone and said, no, 3% is not uh, good enough. It has to be at least 18% chance of complying with the law, or we won't approve it. Uh, and the court said, no, actually it has to be at least 51%, right? If you're going to argue that what you're doing is actually compliant with the law, it has to be more likely than not to do that. So <laughs> those, uh, those extreme cases are the ones that you could win, but the ones where they're picking 51%, right, where we essentially have a coin toss as to whether or not our particular quote is going to keep us on a path to rebuilding the fishery, um, that's, you know, you can't do any better than that um, to help the court system. Um, on the, on the legislative side, there's a problem, right, which is, you know, fish, fisheries, unlike most environmental issues, is one of the least polarized issues in Congress, right? If you look over the 70s and 80s, you see essentially diverging, environmental uh, causes kind of diverging. The 70s was actually not far apart. Republican, Democrat, Republican against environmental, right, De Democratic for more regulation. Fisheries has always been sort of just, it's bipartisan. Uh, there's no champion, okay? Some of the strongest uh, uh, supporters of the council system, which means essentially excluding the uh, Marine Conservation Movement, would be uh, the late Senator Kennedy, Senator Kerry, Liberal Democrats, Barney Frank, and also uh, right, uh, Senator Stevens, and so on. So there was no polarization, pretty much everyone was on the same page. So it was hard to get things done, although a few uh, significant amendments were made. Uh, and finally, at the end of the day, Congress can't do that much because when we're managing natural resources, we've got to have some room 
for discretion, right? We've got to leave the agency choices because we can't foresee all the man management decisions uh, that are going to be necessary in the future. Okay. Um, in the late uh, 90s, right, after losing lots of court cases, after not getting a lot out of Congress, we still see the same council composition, right, 85% industry members. I think what happens is the movement starts to come to terms with its own weakness, its own inability to actually influence the system. So what do we do? Come up with all kinds of crazy schemes. Uh, marine reserves, right? Marine reserves were presented as a scientific, we need to do this in order to save fish. But really, if you think about it, what are they? They're a council free zone, right? Where you have <laughs> an area that you make the rules. Okay? And no one can and there's no debate how much it's zero fishing in a place, it's a council free zone. Okay? So if you could get that, you don't have you no longer have to battle and lose. Um, individual fishing quotas, okay? To me, what these are is basically tools that say, look, we can't influence, we environmental groups can't influence the system. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create these uh, uh, tradable quotas that are going to give fishermen an incentive to be better conservationists. So actually we're gonna let them uh, we're going to change the way that they uh, lobby against conservation by giving them an economic incentive not to fight us so much. I guess that's how I put it, since we can't do it ourselves. Uh, labeling, same thing, right? Let's influence fishermen. Let's make fishermen, by sort of punishing them at the uh, cash register for um, supporting non-sustainable fishing, then they will be our sort of proxy conservationists lobbying for better management, since we can't do it. Uh, some of the obstacles here, uh, people underestimated, I mean a lot of us knew this in the 90s, that reserves, the push for reserves was going to be a disaster because essentially you took uh, groups that were easily separated or hated each other, commercial and recreational fishermen, and made them love each other and hate you. Uh, <laughs> so that was a problem, right? Uh, bad idea. And IFQ is a really, a fisheries eternal matter. We see this now. It's really once you say we're going to IFQs, then there really is not much role uh, anymore for the uh, uh, environmental groups. It's really something that has to be sorted out. It's often difficult to sort out things like allocation and rules for future trading and so forth. Um, and finally, on the labeling right, the public salience of sustainable fisheries is pretty limited, right? I mean, there are certainly, you can go to the restaurant and say it's green, it's red, it's yellow, but most people, it's not a dichotomous choice, right? It's not like this uh, tuna killed four dolphins and this one didn't. That people understand that. Uh, well, the biomass of the cod is you know under uh, 16,000 metric tons for the first time ever. That doesn't really ring the same bell. <laughs> okay. So, right, we're trying to actually, like I said, I think what they're seeing is they have no power. So let's get the fishermen. Uh, to be not as uh, sort of aggressive against conservation as they have been by doing these uh, things economic stuff. And then finally, what we're seeing now is, and this is sort of a second stage of marine reserve, uh, is what I call kind of broadening the scope of the inquiry. In other words, if we can't win the battle head-to-head -head with the industry, what we need to do is bring in some other people to help us feed the industry. And what we're, so what we're seeing now are things like green spatial planning and ocean zoning that are saying, Look, the scope of the inquiry is not about fisheries anymore. It's about use of the ocean, okay? And we're not just talking about creating green reserves for fisheries. It's just, it's a bigger planning process. If you read the literature, especially, um, I'm more of a fan of the ocean zoning terminology, so I'll pick on the marine spatial planning terminology. If you read the literature, it's very vague about what this is supposed to do and what it's supposed to mean. But I think, in my opinion, it's supposed to reframe the negotiation so that marine conservation groups um, have increased uh, leverage uh, over the industry. Um, the key obstacle, uh, well, two of them, one is if you um, follow this kind of through Congress or through the uh, what's called the Interagency Ocean Policy Task Force, what you see is the same kinds of political weaknesses. In other words, really the groups that are having uh, input into the process are not uh, the marine conservation groups, so that was problem. Um, but actually, I think the biggest one, um, and this is a controversial thing I'm about to say, but if you wanted to broaden the scope and you wanted to find an ally that could help you, uh, let's say, defeat or uh, break down the fortress that is the fishery uh, council system, um, you were going to need somebody like that. 
that is oil and gas industry, because they do have more money than the fishing industry. Um, and they also, also, interestingly, I don't have a theory for this yet, they also have been shut out of most of the ocean, like the marine conservation movement, uh, for the last 30 years. So if we can figure out, um, if people are willing to work with them, uh, I think you have to decide whether it's worth it, but um, you can make some progress. Okay, finally done with hypothesis one. I think I'm out on track. Um, so this is my second hypothesis, which is, uh, this is more of a, I cannot have, have zero evidence on that. Uh, the assumption, basically that, this is my idea that there's such a thing out there as this sort of magic thing that will be a win-win for conservation and for the industry. And once we get all of our stocks at OY or MSY, we're going to be happy. I think that's actually wrong. Um, the reason, and I call this the neo pinchotian it's not supposed to be sound that fancy, but uh, MSY framework. What I mean is, uh, Gifford Pinchot, right before, uh, was uh, first head of the US Forest Service, and a professor at Yale, and so on. He just believed in objective scientific management, that there was an answer for conservation. Now, we had to measure lots of things that were hard to measure, like economic benefits of watershed protection. But he believed there was an answer. Um, I think that's a problem in fisheries management. Um, we don't really have the information to get to that answer. But even more than that, right? Um, the problem is, uh, let me, I'll, get, I'll get to why it's a problem in a second. Um, I think it's a problem for the uh, marine conservation groups to push this because essentially it keeps everything in this single decision maker framework. In other words, the councils are still the center of the universe. Um, it establishes extraction, which was a big part of the Tincho or MSY uh, framework, that fishing, as opposed to maybe some other use of that resource as a basis of a healthy marine ecosystem perhaps, uh, is the single and most important use of fishery resources. And most importantly, because of the scientific uncertainty, right, where we've gotten, and because of the risk choices that we have to make when we set a quota, say, um, it makes every decision test the political strength, which is not a good idea if you're in the marine conservation movement, right? That's not a good idea, um, unless you get to make friends with your own gas. Okay. So, um, and there are lots of examples of the policy disagreement that will exist, right, within this MSY uh, Pinchot framework, right, what is the acceptable level of certainty? Remember I gave you the example, 3%, 18%, 51% more. Um, do we prefer the, what kind of risks we like? Do we like to go to Vegas? Do we like to go to Unibonds? Do we prefer the risk of overfishing to the risk of foregone fishing income? Right? Those are the two choices we have um, when we're working with uncertainty. You know, language from the statute, how much bycatch reduction or habitat um, protection is practicable? That's a policy question, right? Um, and, of course, things like are marine reserves are necessary? Right? Remember the uh, Bands of the 1999 AAAS statement, marine reserves are necessary to have fishery management. I don't think that's true. Um, I think they're an option, but it just depends what your goals are, right? Those are policy choices. Okay, so what I think the marine conservation movement needs to realize is that resource management decisions are decisions about values and risk preferences. They're not about numbers or getting to some perfect spot. Um, and compromise, say 51% chance of achieving some rebuilding success is not really, why is that optimal? Right? That's, no, that's not good at all. Um, so my ideas are that essentially the strategy should be a little different. That we should aim for two things that we haven't really, I'm saying we have, uh, marine conservationists should aim for two things that they haven't uh, over time. One is meaningful participation, that is recognition of legitimacy. And my idea there is really that there has to be one change we haven't seen in the Magnuson Act over years, and I think there's a reason we haven't seen it, is some statutory mandate for marine conservation representation on the council. It's just not in there, and it's not going to happen. That has not, um, that has not changed over time. I think that would make a big difference. Secondly, I think we need to look at how public lands are managed and kind of take the oceans in that same direction, which is we look at wilderness areas and national forests, right? Um, national forests are multiple use, right, or BLM land, same thing, multiple use lands where interest groups essentially do battle uh, to determine how land gets used over time. And if you look at now the forest, national forests, not so much in recent years, maybe, 
Um, but certainly on BLM lands, you know, you see a pattern where the resource extraction industries, um, say oil and gas and grazing, uh, tend to do pretty well, and the environmental groups not so much. But wilderness areas are actually <laughs> legislated areas where <coughs> conservation groups always win by default, right? They're the sort of marine reserves of uh, public lands, and they're rooted in this idea that there are multiple legitimate, right, not using the resources is legitimate. That's something we don't see in the fisheries arena. And those uses are incompatible. In other words, we can't have them in the same place. We need to have them geographically separated. OK. So I think that were I advising anyone, no one wants me to advise them. But if, if I were, I would say there should be two priorities. Number one, work on the issue that no one's worked on yet, which is, I'm sure they've worked on it. They haven't succeeded. Council representation. I don't think going through the governors um, to get this done is that uh, effective, hasn't proven to be. Um, so I think Congress is probably the only way. So within that fishery management system, if you want actual representation, um, you're going to have to change, well, change the law. And one thing I want to point out, I think last time I gave a talk sort of on the same paper, someone said, well, this isn't fair. You know, a lot of people on the councils, I'm on the council, and I'm, I'm a conservationist. And I say, I believe, but conservation means different things to different people. We know that. Okay? And so I'm not saying council members aren't conservationists. I'm saying their values are not the same as people who are on environmental groups. And if you think they are, I asked that person, then let's put all, let's make the council all environmental groups and see if you like that. And you say, well, well, I believe in fishing. Well, not as much as you do, right? So I think that's um, what I would say is you need to have actual people on the councils, not people who say they understand what you want. Okay? I can give you another example later. We'll have a question um, of that. That's number one. Uh, number two is, as I said, we need to go towards this. There's a reason why the public lands look the way they do, where we have designated uh, wilderness areas and so on. And one thing I always point out, I think it's kind of interesting, you don't see a lot of, um, there are three of them, but it's quite small, uh, let's say national oil park, right? The National Petroleum Park. We do have one National Petroleum Reserve. We have a couple of small ones. It used to be one in Wyoming. Why is that? Well, it's because of politics, right? In other words, on the BLM plan, where essentially decisions are made at the end of this kind of uh, interest group battle, the oil and gas companies can find, right? Because they can go in there and win. They don't need congressional protection on the public land. So we don't have oil parks. We do have a wilderness area. Why? Because the environmental groups convinced Congress, special thanks to those who remember in Howard Zonizer, who by himself created the Wilderness Act, that was essentially was able to convince Congress, look, we can never win when we have to do battle with these other extractive groups, so you designate areas where they can't even try to. So that's uh, what I think I would say uh, to the marine conservation. Okay, so I'm happy to uh, take your questions. I finished almost about time. And uh, I'll take the first hand up there. I was just curious if you considered the impact of an organization like the Marine um, Stewardship Council, the MSC. Right. Uh, you, you talked about individual consumers looking at the red, green, and, and uh, yellow uh, cards. But, uh, but the MSC, for example, the Alaska Pollock industry is really uh, involved with MSC certification. And how does that fit into your scheme? Well, uh, so I think that's kind of, I mean, it fits into the idea, it's a labeling, right? It's a labeling idea. The idea is we're going to provide economic incentives for uh, fishermen to support sustainable management. That's the idea, because if they do that, then they'll get the label, and they'll be able to, I guess, charge more, have access to different stores. Um, I think that's okay. Um, but, I, you know, what I would say is it's not, uh, well, first of all, MSC is supposed to be a non uh, Nonpartisan, right? Certification group. In other words, it has, and it's really more of a ISO 14,000 model, right? Where the idea is, does it have a management system? Not is that management system achieving certain goals, right? So, I don't think I look at it as the marine conservation movement has at least the people I know it and the what you know the, the uh, literature behind it has certain values embedded in it, and those values are not being expressed in the federal fishery management enterprise. And that's, to me, problematic because it's a public resource. And that's 
I don't know that the labeling is going to get you there. I think the labeling will make, like I said, will make the industry a little bit less aggressive. And that's it. Um, what do you think about using the media, the, the, the groups using media? I'm thinking of the farm sandwich controversy and how the media has been used there to some effect, I think. Although we still eat as much farm salmon as we've always eaten. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I, um, I remember, I'm sure, I don't know that the, if this issue is ever going to be one of great uh, public salience in the United States. You know, in some countries it's a little bit more so. Um, there's, uh, there's some polling data out there that shows that, you know, people care about the oceans. Um, but there was, there's, and there's one survey that said, I can't believe people, I was actually shocked, it said, uh, how like, uh, are you likely to go to a uh, meeting and express your views about fisheries and conservation? And it was like 8% of the people said yes, but I can tell you I've been to, what, thousands of these meetings. I don't think I've ever seen anyone who wasn't there for a reason, right? I mean, there wasn't just a general public person ever. So I think that was maybe just guilt or something. Well, um, it seems to me that you could replace this whole discussion of the maritime industry. The same discussion goes on with the economy. Number one is, you know, there are countries where the, industry, you know, it's, the problem with spending more on manage, on science is that it's a subsidy in some ways, right? I mean, if you had no information, it would be harder, I think, for the, not maybe not now, but at the beginning for the industry to actually go out and borrow money and have a vote. There was no information about how many fish there were. So it's kind of a subsidy. So it's questionable whether we want to do that. Um, the other thing, and I wish I brought, um, there's a great new paper, I didn't have time to work in here, um, by some uh, some, some scientists from Holland, and what they did is they uh, went around um, and handed fishermen, uh, agency, this is for EU fisheries, agency scientists and environmental group people, these uh, charts that basically were uh, 1960 to 2010, CP catch per unit effort and biomass for place and soil in the uh, North Sea. And they had people just draw on there. They'd all seen the charts, the actual charts that were produced by icy scientists you know, many times, but they asked them without looking at it to recreate them. And it was fascinating. So, you know, in terms of fishermen, very optimistic, right, about what the data actually were, uh, scientists, environmental, or the agencies and environmental groups, not so much. So, this is part of this sort of confirmation bias where we all take information and feed it into our worldview. Uh, so, I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, I think that is a part of the problem, but I'm not sure that more information would close the divide, the value divide, or the kind of worldview divide between the industry and the marine conservation movement. Is that the priority crisis, or is this the uh, uh, claim NGOs were meddling? And part of that was credited to the comments out of Alaska, or uh, there are those on our faculty or here locally who would brag otherwise at the North Pacific better management than you described for New England. What's your perception 11 years after that particular piece of information as to how this part of the world 
Uh, well, I, you know, I mean, I'm going to defer in the sense that I don't. Uh, I mean, one of the problems with studying this stuff, and I tried for many years to kind of. Um, I had one project that went on for four or five years back in the, I don't know, 99 to 2004 of you know filing massive FOIA requests and going through all the stock assessments and trying to see what was happening. It's quite difficult to actually figure out what's happening in these fisheries. It's another reason that groups are ineffective, right? Maybe it's related to your question is that just the investment time that you have to make to actually understand what they're doing uh, is massive because you can change a parameter in a model and it will completely right, reorient essentially where you are with respect to, say, where you're rebuilding, right? So there are little things you can do with the science, you all know this better than I do, um, that have, uh, that have a significant impact. So I don't have, I, I know it sounds like I'm avoiding this question. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any uh, special insight into whether, um, we put a little, when we did the, uh, our report on the councils back in 03, we actually asked the question, is the North Pacific Council doing better than other councils? And I think we concluded we can't tell. Um, now they they would tell you uh, otherwise. Yes, sir. I guess it, uh, I wonder if there's some ambiguity in the way this is phrased. I'm looking at priority two. It's ocean governance analysis of federal land management. Suppose, suppose we change things to um, fish governance analysis to large predators and rescue islands. Um, we wouldn't have a lot to boast about, I don't think, if we talk about large In fact, we might have more to boast about the fact that we're fish governments. I would argumentative, but I could at least I could defend that. Maybe not win it, but I could defend that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's all we, that's all we care about. Anyway. <laughs> no one's a judge. Uh, I mean, if they're trade-offs, right? I mean, I guess one of the things I've always wondered is, so for example, you look at greater Yellowstone, and you have two choices. One is make it all BLM. Right, multiple use, or make it all, make, leave it the way it is, completely fragmented, right? With three different national forests, and two different national parks, and a couple of national wildlife refuges, and some state land. Okay, which is work. I mean, on the one hand, right, you think, well, if we manage this one big ecosystem, right, we might be able to deal with some of these wide ranging, uh, you know, larger animals better. On the other hand, the fact that we have at least some good neighbors in the neighborhood, right, some uh, park service and fish and wildlife. Maybe that actually improves the overall quality of um, management. So we don't know really the answer to that question, but it is an issue. Yeah, yeah I mean, just to follow up on that, right, right now, land management consists of uh, wildlife uh, refuges, which you, you can't get to, that they're inaccessible generally. Well, national parks, where you want to show off your wildlife, right. and everywhere else where there's nothing left. Okay. <laughs> See, there are some examples of refuges like the Arctic, you know, places, the Arctic areas, and the islands, and the new preserve north of Hawaii. There are very few examples of national parks with the NPA type ideas, but there are also no examples of you know, <coughs> complete decimation. You, you know, some people might argue against that, but mostly there are still fish swimming around in the ocean. You know, there are still things living that we haven't completely clear cut and plant planted. Uh, the equivalent of maize or whatever else. Um, so the oceans, to some extent, right, they're harder to get to. Between are still fine, whereas on the land, 90% is, is completely gone, paved over or you know, agricultural land. That's where, yeah, that's where I got my slogan, salmon, the unlucky fish. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because it swims near us and it tastes good. So. Uh, but yeah, that's true. The further, the further away you are from people, that's, the further away far you are from people, the better you do. But I mean, I, I think that's more a question of just their accessibility. And it's interesting, if you go back and look at, you know, um, uh, turn of the century restaurant menus, for, I mean, last turn of the century, 1900s, you see mostly wild animals on there, right? It's, uh, you know, uh, robins and uh, uh, geese and uh, uh, boars and things like that. Um, and all those terrestrial, commercial terrestrial uh, enterprises are, didn't work because it's a very, as we all know, it's a very cyclical, uh, in, you know, patterns and lots of the external factors we can't control. And I think the same would be true um, in the oceans if it may eventually be true if we were more effective. Uh, right? We had the equivalent of the Gatling gun that we used to get rid of the passenger bit. So I think the wildlife as a basis for an industry is a, is a risky proposition. Yes, ma'am. Do you think 
looking at a lot of the support that we've seen for um, uh, establishing national parks came from people, well, I think it came from people that you know, experienced national parks when they're younger, and so there's this public support for that as to conserve the, that area. But whereas in the ocean, nobody you know went dive for rarely you go look at what a great place the ocean is and right. want to conserve it. So do you think that how do you think that would play into your that's um, a huge that's a huge part. Uh, if you go back and look at the early uh, congressional hearings, like on Yellowstone or late 1800s, what was great was they had people coming in with paintings, right? And, um, from that were basically um, scientists who were going out, geologists and um, wildlife biologists, or uh, whatever they were called at that time, with paintings of the animals and places and things like that. And that's what motivated Congress to uh, pass the um, act. And for whatever reason, you know, we don't have the same physical connection. Um, and there's not, you know, at least in the wilderness areas, you can argue there is some. Um, I mean, they allow recreational use, right? And there is heavy recreational use of a lot of wilderness areas, and that's what builds the political support for creation. Um, there's a big debate going on right now. It's just reading about in Colorado about more, a couple hundred thousand more wilderness acres, and so that you know there's there is a constituency for it. In the ocean, there's not really <coughs> non-consumptive economic use that can stand up against the consumptive economic uses of fishing, um, so forth. Which is why I think you know, maybe the oil and gas industry is the answer. But I can get nervous saying that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I go to your first priority. Uh, council representation exists in the Australian fisheries management system, which is related in some ways to the way that the US federal, uh, the RFMOs work here. And in fact, a lot of the marine conservation groups don't even want to be on those councils, even though there's a statutory requirement of, and depends how you count it, one or two out of about eight members, and for two reasons. I guess there's, well, one main reason, which is if you've got two members and you vote, you lose, right? Because the other six are still the same players that were there before. Right. And in fact, from a public, from the, from the conservation movement, is it in your interest to be on a committee where you lose every time? It's actually easier to stand on the sidelines and throw stones at the whole process than it is to be part of the process and hope that your goodwill will somehow infuse into the rest of the people. So I wonder, when you say council representation, are you really saying basically re reboot the entire system? Because otherwise, unless you can somehow get the state appointees to vote differently, all you're doing is a 9 to 1, 10 to 1, 14 to 1 outcome on the vote. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that. So uh, one of the um, first times I ever thought about this concept of spatial management was back in the 90s when I was on a, an advisory panel for Fisher and East Coast, and it was a socioeconomic panel, right? So we had um, me, the environmental group representative, and then 17 fishermen, right? And I lost every single vote, 17, I never got another vote. I never, even for things that I thought, I mean, I'm a pretty reasonable person, they were pretty reasonable. <laughs> I lost everything 17 to 1. Now eventually we did convince, I convinced the head, who was a, a crazed uh, 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 surf plan fisherman, to um, at least when we went to the full council, he would say uh, the vote was 17 to 1, and the one person voted against it because, so he at least gave the minority view. But when I, at that time, I remember uh, thinking to myself, wow, this would be so much different if instead of a vote, I had 1 18th of the ocean, right? <laughs> and then, and then, right, then I actually have leverage, which is the argument behind the second one here, which is then I can say, look, I'm happy to give you right to come in and fish sustainably in my area, because I have valuable fish to offer you, 17 people, if you in exchange, right, will do certain things in your area. So then we can actually have a legitimate, fair negotiating framework. And I think that's the political idea that I would see behind, say, ocean zoning, marine spatial planning. I don't see it as a science question at all. I see it as a framework for negotiating. But I think you're right. I mean, it's no fun to lose it. And that's what actually marine reserves, right? They represent the place where you win automatically. Well, voters say you win. So that's important. Um, and it's, sorry, just to say one last thing. This is what, you know, Columbia, South Carolina, where I live, 60% uh, uh, Caucasian, 40% African American, up until the 70s, right? We have 10 city council members, all white. Okay, why is that? We have that large vote. Okay? That means every vote, 60 40, 
no African American representation. Well, if you start splitting it up into districts, now we have six and four, right? Um, and we actually have fair representation. So it's important to have places where even groups that don't represent the, like, the majority win sometimes and get to participate in that upper level of decision making. That's what's not going on uh, right now with respect to reconstruction. Yes? Um, I'm curious about when you listed the threats to, uh, perceived threats to sustainable fisheries, one of the NGOs, uh, one of the reasons listed was misinforming the public about fisheries. I'm curious whether there's, uh, there might be an important lesson there about, uh, basically as a scientist with a strong conservation ethic, uh, nothing hurts me more than to see a well-meaning environmental group totally missing through the science. <coughs> And they claims, you know, that fisheries around the world are in collapse and um, that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm curious whether, for, for me as a scientist, that seems like a big problem that would undermine NGOs' uh, effectiveness, not being careful with the science. Um, but I'm a scientist, so I'm curious whether, from your perspective, um, it's really important for NGOs to get the science right, or whether that's well, remember, science is never going to tell you what to do. Okay? <clears throat> science is going to say, here's what we think is going on with this population. And if you do X, reduce the quota by 20%, then there's an X percent chance that the stock will increase. Okay? So you're, those are the kinds of truths. It's never going to tell you that you should do that or do more or do less. And so this is kind of my point about stepping away from saying, yes, there's a win-win solution that if we just figure out the science, we can all be happy, to saying, no, you know, you prefer you industry prefer to take a, you know, a more aggressive position. In other words, push it a little bit within that uncertainty bound and say, you know, if it doesn't hit the rebuilding threshold on time, we're okay with that. Okay? Because we're willing to take that risk because we get income in the meantime. On the other hand, right, the, um, the uh, marine conservation movement is saying, no, let's invest the money in mutual funds. If it turns out we could have caught more in the short run, but we gave that up to make sure that we didn't overfish it, that's okay. You see what I'm saying? So I, I think the science, over-reliance on science is actually a negative uh, thing for marine conservation. I mean, to say science is going to tell us what to do. What we need to say is we have a different value system, and our system is not pushing it to the brink every time. Right? We want to actually try to manage. That's why we need different manage space A in one way and space B in another way. One more question. Okay, one last question. Yeah. I'm curious when you present these results to NGOs, given the investment that they've made in labeling or community standards, how they respond to you? And well, I don't have the actual results, right? Well, no, no. what you already is. Oh. How they respond if they reject it? They know if it's the only thing that makes it great, you just need to get more money and do it more? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm friends with, I right, know most of the people, like I said, it's a pretty small world. Um, I think most of them would say they're disappointed. Um, you ask them looking back over, um, what the influence has been, I mean, you can point to a few things. You can point to that NRDC versus Daily, where the court said, no, all management measures have to have a 51% chance of success. That's the highlight of the last 20 years. <laughs> so what are you going to really say about that? Um, you know, it's, it, uh, I think people now are encouraged, or at least seemingly, by, you know, they, and they keep changing these strategies. If you, go, if you follow this stuff closely, you'll see one year it's all marine reserve. Now no one talks about marine reserves anymore. Now it's all ocean zoning, marine spatial planning. And I think there's some hope that somewhere in that process, like I said, that because it's not just marine conservation versus fishing industry, that there's more room for some success. So I think people are optimistic, um, especially with the different administration. But whether that will play out, I'm not really so sure. So um, you know, I don't know. I haven't tested it out on, on them yet, but. Uh, but I think most people would say it hasn't been a roaring success. So first we should thank our speaker.